Well, good morning, everybody. Today is the first Sunday in Lent, and it's the time when we focus on the the, the baptism of Jesus. And uh, but I want to take you first of all to Psalm 25, a psalm of praise. And it says, "To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul; in you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame." but they will be put to shame who are treacherous and without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are my God and my Saviour. And my hope is in you all day long. Let's pray. Loving God, in you and you alone does my soul find its complete satisfaction and deep contentment. Yet with every stirring, with everything that happens, we are in danger of always panicking and trying to find our own way of doing things. You are our source and wisdom. You are the rest for our souls. Help us to put our full and total trust in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm turning to Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 1, verse 9 to 15. Mark doesn't say a great deal about the baptism or the temptation of Jesus. And uh, so because today we're looking at Mark chapter 1, verse 9 to 15. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being opened and a spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice from heaven, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. Let's pray. To you, our Lord, do I lift up my soul. Lord, this morning we ask that you would raise our sights a little, as we look around us, we see the busyness, we see dissatisfaction, struggles, jealousies. And it's so easy to be caught up and overwhelmed by what seems to be a dysfunctional world until we lift our eyes to you, not just our eyes, but our soul. And we find it is in you that we find our peace and our rest. In you, O Lord, do I put my trust when circumstances are overwhelming and the demands of the world are unrealistic, bring us back to you as the centre of our being. Teach us what's essential and what's not. Teach us not to react to the loudest voice, but to listen to your voice above all. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Sometimes in this world we feel lost, swallowed up in a plethora of demands. You know the way. There is only one way and it's your way. Lord, lead us in that path. So this morning, Lord, we ask that you would teach us to trust, to fully place our souls in your hands. And we ask that you would forgive us for those times when we have turned away, sought our own way, been drowned by the world, been absorbed by the calls of people around us. And Lord, bring us back to that point of trust, that point of soul lifting, where you can replant us again in the rich soil of your trust and your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to call on Ben. Morning everyone, it's uh, great to be here, great to be here with Russell as well, uh, great to see him. Uh, I'll be reading from Luke 4, 1 to 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days and at the end of them was hungry. 
The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendour. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels, angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. And this just uh, coincides with what Russell read, which um, Johnson's going to speak on. So we better get the man up here and we'll hear his message. Thanks, Reverend Johnson. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Ben, and also Reverend Russell for leading the worship and reading of the scriptures. Um, this morning I've decided to share with you on the theme would you take the crown without the cross would you take the crown without the cross in our gospel reading this morning in Luke chapter 4 it is Jesus first day on the job immediately he's confronted with three major temptations and he's confronted with this basic question would ye take the crown without the cross? These are the most best temptations in the life and the form of the foundation for all other temptations. I would propose that when temptation comes our way, if we will pause and classify the temptation, we would be able to identify it with one of these three temptations just first. We'll also be able to better equipped to answer certain with the ways and obedience of Christ. This is the first Sunday in Lent. It is a time of in-depth reflection upon the passion and death of Jesus, as well as a period of repentance for both the church and for us individually. Our Lenten journey begins this year with a review of the temptation of Jesus Christ. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness to be in communion with God and to reflect upon his upcoming ministry. While the Satan confronts Jesus, it is a reminder to us that goodness is not synonymous with innocence. True goodness comes only after a struggle with evil. So let's look at the three temptations. The first one is the stone into bread. The temptation to use power for the wrong purposes. The second one is jump on the rocks. The temptation to gain popularity by performance. Number three, save the wrong master. The temptation to idolatry. So the first one, turning stone into bread. The first temptation we shall, the temptation is to use power for the wrong purposes. So in the first temptation, Satan addresses Jesus by saying, if you are the son of God, it may look as if Satan is questioning Jesus' credentials, but he's not. He never questions the credentials of Jesus. He knows who he is, what he's doing trying to get Jesus to question himself and to doubt himself. If he can get Jesus for just a moment to question himself, to misuse his power, to take the crown without the cross, and to turn the stone into bread, you will have won. And you will have forced Jesus into seducing humanity into, into, into obedience. You see, this is not just about Jesus being hungry after fasting for 40 days. This is certain tempting Jesus to meet need of world hunger. Use your power, the devil says, to address the issue of human hunger. Jesus would have sought to buy our affection and devotion just by giving us those, those things. 
But that is a false picture of many kind. We do not live for things, but for intimacy. We do not live for the marketplace, but for the family. Jesus put it this way. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So Satan has misunderstood mankind and therefore misunderstood Jesus' needs. To be sure, he sees that he is hungry. So what he does not understand is that there is not any another type of hunger. It is the hunger of righteousness. So Jesus is feeding himself on the word of God. He is talking of the physical hunger. Satan has challenged Jesus to feed a hungry world. What Jesus is saying is that you cannot know what is good unless you first read the scriptures. So we are created to please God, to be in right relationship with God, and we must therefore God to God's word. So every time we face challenges, let us go to God's word and find out what does the word of God say. It is easy to lose track of who we are and why we are here. It is now a very long time since we are in the garden. Sin has wrecked humanity. It is difficult to imagine what man was like in the Garden of Eden by viewing him as he is now. Imagine if you knew nothing of aircrafts and many kinds ability to fly it. Now imagine that you came upon the wreckage of an aircraft and you, you along with many others, tried to reconstruct the original version of the aircraft and have never seen it. If we knew nothing of flying, would that list us make that this pile of rubbish had once soared above the earth? So the material would be the same. The capability of flight, however, would be lost. So what we have lost is our understanding of what mankind once was. Obedient and righteous. The image of God, the reflection of the divine. So this is what Jesus reminds Satan. Bread is not how mankind lives. Not soul and not primarily. So he lives in obedience to the word of God. If we come to God, we come because we belong to him, not because he has something for us. So we come because our soul needs to be in his presence, not because of our belly needs to be filled. No, we need to fill our soul, soul, souls. So that's why we come to worship. It's not that we come to seek for the bread. Not that certain is real and personal. Not an idea or a force. A fallen angel, Satan, the devil, is the powerful enemy of God and his people. He should be taken seriously. And here we see Satan asking, wouldn't you rather have your desires made first? Your cravings satisfied in fully. Wouldn't you rather take the crown without the cross? These are the questions Jesus had to answer. Then we go to the second temptation we shall call, follow on the ropes. So the temptation is to gain popularity by performance. And if the first temptation deals with the physical needs of Jesus, then the second deals with his reputation. So the devil sees Jesus on the pinnacle of the temple. Jump off, he said. For it is written, he shall give his angel charge over you to keep you in all your ways. So this is a quote from Psalms 91. Do you see what has happened? In the first temptation, Jesus had answered Satan by saying, it is written. So Satan is a fast learner. He begins this, this temptation with the ways, it is written. He is countering what Jesus had said. Jesus had said in the first place, it is written. And now Satan also starts this second temptation by saying, it is written. So it is written. He is showing Jesus that he is capable of quoting the scriptures as well. But he is quoting the scriptures to his own purpose. Not the scriptures so that they can benefit everyone. So Jesus refuses to jump. However, quoting from yet another verse. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. So this is a quote from Deuteronomy 6 verse 16. Does this mean that the book of Deuteronomy is more important than Psalms 91? No. No, it's not like that. But it does that simply quoting scripture is not enough. The devil that simply quotes the scriptures, even Satan can do that. So it is the interpretation that we give to the scripture that matters. You cannot manipulate scripture for your own purposes or even for what we perceive to be the purposes of God. 
I've seen a lot of politicians quoting the scriptures out of context because they wanted to manipulate and use the people. And this is the wrong thing to do. Say it another way. We cannot accomplish the will of God by our own efforts. Abraham tried to do this when he lay with his maid servant, Hagar and had Ishmael. So God's response was, Abraham, I told you that Sarah shall have a son. In time, God's promise is fulfilled and Isaac is born, but there is a problem. The promise of God must now be taken from the firstborn, Ishmael, and given to the second, Isaac. Jela sets in and in the end, Hagar and Ishmael's lives are ruined when they are banished from the tribe. All this is because Abraham tried to force God's promise. He couldn't wait for what God has said. You do not test a promise of God. Try to accomplish it by your own means, even if those means are backed up with the scripture. Jesus cannot do a right thing for a wrong reason. This is why he's saying that. So Satan asks, wouldn't you rather avoid the long wait accomplishing your goal? Just take the simple way. Wouldn't you rather avoid the path that requires patience? Wouldn't you rather circumvent suffering? Wouldn't you rather take the crown without the cross? This is what the devil was aiming at. You should take the crown without the cross. Now we go for the third temptation we shall call save the wrong master. So the temptation to idolatry. In the third temptation, Satan finally comes out in this open. He no longer flatters by calling him son of God. No, he has changed now. He shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and tells him that all of this will be his. If just for a moment, he will bow down and worship him. He is saying, you want people to follow you? You do? Then simply blink your eyes at evil and they will come in droves. So, but Jesus refuses to change the world by becoming part of the world. We are in the world, but not of the world. So you don't change the world by becoming part of the world. Again, he calls from Moses in the Old Testament, you shall worship the Lord your God and he alone shall you save. If the world comes to Jesus, it must rise up to him. For he will not go down to it. He will not be enticed by the glitter of the world because he created that world. In fact, so the trial is now over. Satan has failed in his attempt to bribe Jesus with fame fortune and power so at this point jesus says satan be gone so the implication is that jesus has merely been tolerating the presence of satan but the devil does not go away empty-handed he still has all of his kingdom and he now knows something about the nature of god he understands god's restraints so in conclusion Another important matter is that we cannot see this temptation in the wilderness as only time for Jesus encountered evil. Clearly, he faced it over and over again. Take for example, when Jesus turned his face to Jerusalem, it was Simon Peter who tried to talk him out of it by saying, in essence, you don't have to do this. And Jesus told him, get behind me, Satan. Additionally, there was the scene when Jesus was on the cross the centurion turns him and says, if you are the son of God, then jump down from the cross and save yourself. So he's trying to ask Jesus, if. So in most of the temptations that we are asked is if you are a Christian, if you are a child of God, if you are this. So we try to answer those temptations by answering the question of if. So the scene sounds hauntingly familiar to the scene where Satan challenged Jesus to jump. So Jesus struggled with the evil and temptation over and over again. So the crucial question for this morning is, what does all of this mean for us? The ultimate temptation of Jesus was that he could have a crown without a crown, a cross. So easy. That is the temptation that we, his followers, still face today. We want power without painful rejection. We want risk with no danger. We want victory with limited commitment. That's what a lot of Christians are today. Some Christians say that to be a Christian means that life is all beautiful. I, I don't know who ever told the, the Christians. The Bible doesn't mean that to be a Christian, life is so beautiful. 
is full of temptations, it's full of bad things. It strikes me that temptation of Christ is saying something quite different. It is saying life is a struggle. That is what I learned from this. Life is a struggle. Life is a wilderness experience. So you will be tempted by evil. All your life, every day we are being tempted by evil. Every day of our life. So from Jesus' experience we learn that God may lead you into dangerous and intense spiritual battles. We won't always feel good. In fact, we will have times of deprivation, times of loneliness, times of hostility. It also teaches us that Jesus did, in fact, experience extreme temptation. He knows what we are facing and he knows how we feel. Because Jesus faced it. So I want to remind you today, in those times when you are in the wilderness, trying to find your way through, and when, we, when temptation comes and offers you the wrong answer, the wrong choice, the wrong use of power, the way to popularity, the wrong kind of partnership, then you remember that Christ was tempted as well. So you are not alone in the struggle because Christ was tempted as well. But he did not turn those stones into bread. He fed himself with the word of God. He did not fling himself upon the rocks. He wanted no man's approval but God's approval. He did not render service to Satan. He obeyed his father in heaven. And those are the things we need to follow. And this, I suppose, is the twist ending of Lent. If Jesus saves himself, he cannot save you. He can save you. Jesus was tempted to take the crown without the cross and he did not. Would you take the crown without the cross? What I mean is that you want to have the crown without the pain it takes. Following Jesus means a lot. It may mean suffering. It may mean walking alone in the wilderness without anyone following you. It may mean a lot of things in your Christian journey. So let us create our own crown, which has nothing to do with the cross. We need to move to the crown with the cross in front of us. So when we are moving as a Christian, the cross is always in front of you. Which voice do you listen to? Is it the voice of the tempter? I, I, I was reading these days, one, 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 one says, uh, the modern young person, he, his prayer is like, Lord, lead us not in temptation, but tell us where the temptation is so that we can meet it there. <laughs> lead us not in temptation, but tell us where temptation is and we'll go and meet it there. So the young modern Christian is looking for where temptation is. They would go where temptation is. They want to flock where temptation is. And we are saying, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So that is our prayer today, which was then and is true is there. Deliver us from evil. May the good Lord help us as we think upon these ways, as we think that temptation is always before me. It always moves. My, I know my sin, it moves before me every time. And that is what it is. God help us from now and evermore. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you. I, I thank you for the word you have given us this morning. I, I thank you that this word will find its place in the heart of other people. I, I pray that this word will find to help us as we move every day of our life. It will be the food for our journey. It will help us, Lord Jesus Christ, as we face temptation every day that we are able to fight temptation through the word of God and interpreting it correctly so that we are not also in the temptation where the devil can quote scriptures, whereby we quote scriptures only to our own purpose, but we quote the scriptures according to what the Bible says and according to God's purposes. So help us, Lord, guide us so that we remain firm and strong in your scriptures. Thank you, Father. In your name I pray. Amen. Thanks, Johnson, and uh, for leading us in that, uh, serve, uh, that message and also in, in uh, advising us that uh, the cross 
is part of the Christian's journey to take up our cross and follow him. There is no crown without a cross. We're going to uh, dedicate the offering and uh, encourage you in your giving uh, to this church and also to the work of God uh, worldwide. Let's pray over the offering. Loving God, we thank you that you've given us so much. We thank you for your, uh, the times when, when you have just interceded with us or for us. The times when uh, we have been perhaps in difficult financial situations and you have worked us through those. And Lord, you've been so generous to us in so many ways. And we pray your blessing over that which we give to you. We pray that what we do with our gifts um, will be done in such a way that they will be used to your glory. We pray to you for that which we keep for ourselves to use. May we use it wisely and uh, in accordance uh, with the wisdom that you've given us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you this day and forevermore. Amen.